friends, I am glad to announce that baptism classes will begin in two weeks. There will be a total of three sessions to help you understand the significance of baptism in the Christian faith. Drop our church office a WhatsApp message by the 28th of February or contact your CG leader if you wish to attend the classes. Our church will arrange the baptism classes and later on the baptism sessions in a safe setting. Now let's get excited and ready to receive from God's Word. So listen in and welcome our brother Colin Wong. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a joy and a pleasure to be with all of you again uh, to worship God and to interact together uh, on God's Word. Now, the title of uh, today's message is A Renewed Vision. And we are going to look at uh, Acts chapter 10, uh, from verses 9 to the first part of verse 23. Now, we're going to pick up where we left off uh, two weeks ago on a watershed moment in God's redemptive history. And it's a very significant e uh, uh, incident which uh, involve, and the persons involved in this real-life drama, this significant incident, uh, are Peter, uh, Cornelius and his household, uh, as well as the central church in Jerusalem. Now, this key incident is recorded for us from Acts chapter 10, verse 1, all the way through to chapter 11, verse 18. Now, for ease of reference, I will uh, call this uh, event the Cornelius Incident. Now, the Cornelius Incident is a defining moment for the church and the gospel movement. Why? Because it marks a turning point in the narrative of Acts, where from here on, we see the gospel spreading out in all geographical directions towards uh, many different cross-sections of people and nations in the known civilized world at that time. Now, it was an incident that re-emphasized the fact that God's heart is for all peoples of the world. And we will talk more about that uh, later during our time together today. Now, for the purpose of our Sunday sermons here in SS Gospel Centre on the Book of Acts, uh, the Cornelius incident has been divided into uh, four sections. Uh, firstly, uh, God's direction of Cornelius, chapter 10, verses 1 to 8, uh, which our brother Aaron Tham uh, has covered two weeks ago. And secondly, God's direction of Peter, right, which is uh, what we are looking at today. And thirdly, Peter's preaching and Cornelius' household coming to faith in chapter 10, verses 23b, yeah, second part of 23 to verse 48, which will be explored next week. And then fourthly, Peter's deliberation of the incident with the Jerusalem church, which is in chapter 11, verses 1 to 18, uh, that will be dealt with uh, the week after next. Now, two weeks ago, uh, our brother Aaron Tham gave an impactful message on that first section of the, 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 the Cornelius incident in chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. And I think it's important that we recap uh, the main points that he shared, uh, which were clearly given to us in three parts. Three parts. Uh, firstly, the story about Cornelius, uh, God's big story, and then my story. Now, in the story about Cornelius, we were encouraged uh, to in a manner of speaking, uh, go nuts about sharing the gospel with people, right? Whether, whether it's uh, crack nuts or tough nuts. Now, in God's big story, we were shown that this sub-story of Cornelius and Peter is part of the larger story of God working to change uh, his people's mindset in order to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. And lastly, uh, in my story, uh, our brother Aaron consolidates his message by sharing from his experience, uh, testifying to the truth about how God goes ahead uh, to prepare people and the importance of responding to the Spirit's prompting to reach out to these people. Now from Cornelius, today we turn our attention to the Apostle Peter as we continue to see how God's hand coordinates this uh, Cornelius incident with its uh, little series of uh, very fortunate events in order to effect yeah, uh, his plans and purposes. So let's now listen uh, to a dramatized Bible reading of Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 9 to the first part of verse 23. 
The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you are looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is to borrow from uh, a brother Aaron Thumb and uh, structure today's message in three parts. Uh, that correspond to the flow of his message two weeks ago. And I hope this will help us uh, connect the dots between all the subplots that make up uh, this Cornelius incident. And the three main parts for today's message are Peter's story, God's big story, and our story. Now, in Peter's story, we will focus on Peter and the vision he received. And in God's big story, we will uh, reiterate uh, the overarching purpose of God through this Cornelius incident. And finally, in our story, uh, we will explore what this means, what all these means for us today. Right? So let's look first at Peter's story. Uh, now, Cornelius, having been, been, been encountered by God, uh, immediately dispatched a team of his men to go get Peter uh, in obedience to what the angel of God had told him to do. Now, we are told earlier in chapter 10, verses 5 to 6, that Peter was staying at uh, Simon the Tanner's home in Joppa, which is a city that is on the coast uh, facing the Mediterranean Sea. Now, a tanner is basically someone who produces uh, leather. Now, it was the day after Cornelius' vision, Okay, and, 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 and Peter was up on the top of the, 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 the house at noon uh, for an undisturbed time of prayer. Now, it was noonday, so it was close to lunchtime. Uh, so we can't really blame Peter for getting hungry now, right? Uh, so how interesting that God would actually introduce a food-themed vision uh, in this moment of Peter's hunger. Now, we are told that Peter fell into a trance, or in the original Greek, uh, the word is ecstasis. Now, trance here, or ecstasis, which is where ecstasy comes from, now, trance here is not to be understood in the way that we understand it in modern times, where it conjures up this image of uh, someone being hypnotized uh, in an uncontrolled and altered state of consciousness. Instead, uh, in its biblical context here, the term is used to express uh, Peter being taken into a state that is uh, beyond the realm of ordinary perception, uh, to receive a vision where God is communicating directly and clearly to him in a controlled and fully functional uh, state of awareness. Now, this is proven in the nature uh, of Peter's conversation with God because we see Peter responding in a measured and rational way, where he turns down the call to eat unclean animals, just as he would uh, in his normal state of mind uh, as a Jewish law-abiding 
believer. So a voice from heaven told Peter uh, to take and eat the unclean animals, reptiles and birds that uh, filled this uh, sheet that came down uh, from heaven. And Peter was shocked at this invitation to eat because he recognized that those animals there were religiously unclean and they were not kosher according to Old Testament laws. And so in refusing to eat them, uh, Peter believed he was being obedient to God. And you can't fault him for abstaining from unclean food in accordance to the religious laws that he knew so well. Uh, in fact, Peter's response is actually very much part of God's process and interaction with him in order to develop his faith and growing knowledge in the Lord's ways. Now, the message uh, of the heavenly reply was very clear. God has cleansed the food, so they are no longer unclean. Now, the message was important enough to have it repeated three times. Now, after the vision ended, Peter was at first puzzled at what God wanted to communicate. But with the instruction of the Holy Spirit, along with the arrival of Cornelius' team and their explanation of why they were there, all that helped Peter to decipher what God was revealing through this vision. Now, at one level, Peter began to understand that the food laws were no longer in place since Jesus Christ has already come as the fulfillment and culmination of Old Testament laws. And this abolishment of food laws was not, uh, it's, it's, it's not a random decision on God's part that was done uh, like haphazardly. Uh, but because God is sovereign, He is faithful, He does not self-contradict, this was purposefully established as part of God's redemptive process for the world through Christ. So my friends, uh, in case you are wondering, uh, yes, as a good Christian, you can continue to enjoy your char siu, your pakute, your babi panggang, and your bacon. So that's at one level, but at, an, at, at, at another level, uh, we need to understand the concepts of food and meal fellowship from an Israelite perspective in order to appreciate the significance of this Cornelius incident. The food laws represented Israel's consecration from the other nations. Therefore, in the mind of the Jews, to have food fellowship with Gentiles and to eat the food prepared by them is to associate with a religiously unclean people, which then puts them at risk of becoming unclean as well. Now, unfortunately, the Jews ended up turning food purity distinctions into human discrimination. Actually, God's idea of consecrating Israel to himself has nothing to do with excluding other nations. Instead, Israel's holy and consecrated national life was meant to draw other nations to God. However, the Israelites misapplied the concept of being set apart and they ended up erecting a man-made barrier that effectively barred the Gentiles from uh, table fellowship with the Lord. So it wasn't meant to be so, but that's the reality that panned out. So besides the cessation of food laws, Peter began to understand that God was using this vision of unclean food now made clean to portray unclean Gentiles made clean. And along with the, Gen uh, along with the Jews, uh, God has the Gentiles equally in his heart. And God was sending this very clear message to every faithful Jewish believer at that time represented here in the person of Peter, who was an important Jewish apostolic and leadership figure. And the message was this, God wanted the Jewish believers to tear down their self-erected social and cultural barriers and to go to the Gentiles with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Peter was obedient to, 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 to God's direction. Now, I don't think it was so simple for Peter because it involved setting aside uh, deeply indoctrinated practices that he had followed for years. Uh, moreover, there would have been uh, the, 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 the Jewish uh, 
uh, external cultural pressure. Yet, we see that there is almost an instantaneous change in his attitude demonstrated by his hospitality towards his guests who were servants of a Gentile man where he hosted the guests overnight before the trip uh, to go see Cornelius uh, the next day. Now, having looked at Peter's story, let's move now to um, the overarching narrative of God's big story. Now, the Cornelius incident was a milestone event that God coordinated because he had to re-establish very clearly to his people at that time that he is a God who loves the whole world, not just one particular group of people. Now, I use the word re-establish because the church at that time still had a lot of, uh, if you like, Jewishness in them. Lah. And, 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 and they had ignored the fact that God's purpose right from the beginning has always been about the salvation of people from all nations, from all ethnicities, and from all cultures. And God's election of Israel was not favoritism, but a divine strategy to set in motion God's salvation program through one people to all peoples. So all along, yes, even from the Old Testament, the divine idea is for Gentiles to be part of God's faith community. Now, when, when, when God called Abraham, God promised that he would make of him a great nation and to bless them in order that in them, all families of the earth, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. And then you have Gentiles like uh, Rahab and Ruth, and they are included in the ancestry of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1. Gentile names were intentionally included in Jesus' uh, genealogy alongside Jewish names in order to demonstrate God's identification with all peoples of the world. Now, unfortunately, uh, God's covenant people of Israel lost sight of this and they got caught up in their misplaced sense of pride as God's chosen people. They forgot that as covenant people of God, they were called out in order to call in other nations to God. So therefore, God had to uh, realign the early church and its uh, majority Jewish believers at that time back to the universal reach of God's salvation program. And with the Cornelius incident, God clearly confirms that the Gentiles are very much included in the church and they are, they, they are very much given the right to be the covenant people of God. Not on account, uh, uh, not on account of uh, observance of the old covenant rituals, but on account of faith through the new covenant fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So in short, the gospel is for the whole world. Now allow me to just consolidate what we have uh, discovered so far. Now firstly, in the light of Peter's story, uh, we have seen how Peter obediently responded to the renewed vision uh, from God to cross social and cultural barriers with the gospel. And then secondly, uh, in the light of God's big story, uh, we have seen how this Cornelius incident is part of the larger story of God working to transform all peoples of the world with the gospel of Christ. And this involved uh, uh, an overhaul, an overhaul of the restricted vision of God's people at that time uh, in order to become a renewed vision that recognizes and affects the worldwide reach of God's salvation. Now, as we come to our story, our story, uh, let us then now ask, what does all these mean for us? What does it mean for us to have a renewed vision? What does it mean for us today in the light of what we have seen, this biblical account of the Cornelius incident uh, involving Peter in particular today? Now, let me just share two applications for us uh, from today's biblical text. And the first application is this. A renewed vision is a renewed commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. 
A renewed vision isn't so much about re-innovating our vision for church, but it is supremely about rediscovering God's vision for our church. A renewed vision isn't so much about coming up with new things, but it's very much about coming back to God and reclaiming anew His fundamentals for us. Now, the apostles and disciples during the time of Acts, they knew. They knew about the great commandment and the great commission that was given by Jesus Christ. And, 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 and the early Jewish believers had to realize that loving God and their neighbors and making disciple of, disciples of all nations meant loving their Gentile neighbors and making disciples of Gentile people as well. So this renewed vision from God was essentially a renewed commitment to the fundamentals of the Great Commandment and the Great Commission. And, and, and now is a good time as any for us to recap the great commandment and the great commission given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 31 tells of the great commandment given by Jesus Christ. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And then we go to Matthew chapter 8, verses 18 to 20. And we see here the great commission given by Jesus Christ. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A renewed commitment. A renewed commitment to the great commandment and the Great Commission. That's the renewed vision for us. It's about reclaiming the fundamental purpose of the church as commanded and commissioned by the head of the church, Jesus Christ. You know, recently a few of us uh, heard from a pastor and how it broke his heart. This pastor was sharing and, 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 and he said that it, 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 it broke his heart to see churchgoers participating in uh, 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 things like, you know, all these prophetic ministry workshops and healing seminars, but they don't really know Jesus in a personal and interpersonal faith relationship. And, 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 and when he shared about this, you know, this reality points to the need for a fresh rediscovery and a renewed commitment to the fundamentals of the Christian gospel. And we long for revivals. We long for spiritual renewals to take place among us. We long for experiences of uh, miraculous and spectacular interventions from above. We yearn for a renewed vision uh, uh, or, or a prophetic revelation from God. Yet it was Charles Finney, uh, Charles Finney, a Christian leader who was heavily involved in the great the, the second great awakening actually, and the spiritual revival in the United States. He said this. A revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. So let us together as a church renew our commitment to obey the great commandment and the great commission. Now in light of the great commandment, let us as, uh, uh, let us as a church love God, love our neighbour. Right? Are we relating to our friends, our colleagues, uh, even strangers? with kindness and respect are the words and the things that uh, you post on social media. Are they reflecting love for neighbour? In the light of the Great Commission, let us as a church be faithful in making disciples as Christ has commanded us to. And to love God and neighbour is to multiply those who will also love God and neighbour. 
So, so, so let's get involved. Get involved in, in, in SSGC's ministry and efforts, uh, whether it's Alpha Program, uh, pastoral care, discipleship classes, care groups, children's ministry, youth ministry, and so on and so forth. And witness. Let us witness to the love of Christ through the whole of our lives. The whole of our lives, every day, every moment. Witness for Christ, a renewed vision, is a renewed commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. The second application I want to make is this. A renewed vision is a renewed commitment to consecration. Consecration. You know, Israel as a covenant people were to be a consecrated people, meaning they were to be set apart as holy and dedicated as a people unto the Lord. But consecration does not mean isolation. Instead, God's purpose was for Israel to be called out in order to call in other nations to God. And in very much the same way, we as God's covenant people through Christ, we have been called out so that we will call in others to God. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, set apart. Why? That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, we have been called out of darkness into his light. And we as a covenant people of God, we are a consecrated people of God. And notice from this Bible verse, what does that consecration lead to? that you may proclaim the excellencies of God. So we have been called out in order to call in others to God. God calls us to distinctiveness, not discrimination. Our distinctiveness must draw people to Christ, not shut them out. Therefore, a renewed vision is a renewed commitment to consecration. You know, the church cannot expect to evangelize effectively if the church is not holy. We, we, we cannot expect to proclaim the gospel while betraying the gospel. And evangelism and disciple-making requires a holy and consecrated church. When the church is not consecrated, our gospel life and witness suffers. And, and, and that's why our renewed commitment to the great commandment and the great commission must also involve consecration. So we must be very careful not to misuse the great commandment and the great commission to justify compromises that we make on holiness and obedience. Beware of the compromises that we can be compelled to make in the name of making it easier for people to know Jesus. And we may think such compromises facilitate the mission of the church. No, on the contrary, such compromises actually compromise the mission of the church. And you know, the current cultural and, and moral climate is very hostile towards God and His ways. Right? The moral foundations are crumbling all around. Sin and wickedness are tolerated, accepted, even celebrated. The value and, 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 and gifts of human life, of gender, of sexuality are desacralized. Personal freedoms are exalted. Uh, uh, <clears throat> personal freedoms are exalted uh, in the name of self-interest. And, 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 and moral... <sighs> what many of us deem as acceptable in this day and age is actually destroying lives. We think they're good, but they're destroying lives. And we need to reflect and consider very carefully, have we, the church, people of God, huh, have we become so entrenched in worldly values that we have lost our redeeming influence in the world? And this is the struggle of our generation, the cross we bear, as it were, in these days. How do we live a godly life yet still be among a circular culture and its people without compromising our spiritual vitality and without jeopardizing our godly influence. 
And I believe the answer lies in walking with Jesus day by day. That's what consecration is all about. Walk with Jesus day by day. Walk in the grace of Jesus Christ day by day. And don't be afraid to be distinct, my friends. Don't be afraid to be distinct. As a consecrated people of God, let our story be one where Christ shines through us a light that is so beautiful that people will want to know who is that source of that light? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And, and, and don't be afraid to say no to things that are wrong. Just because it is popular, just because it is uh, acceptable, doesn't make it right and true, you know? In fact, you know what? Learning to say no to worldly influences is, is God's way of actually bringing about a yes from people to Christ. Now remember, uh, when we say no, it is not from a position of defeat. It is from a position of victory that is secured in Jesus Christ. Jesus was in the world, but he overcame. It's a done deal, my friends. We who are called to follow him can experience the same. For Jesus himself has said this in John chapter 16, verse 33. In the world, you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world, said Jesus. So what does it mean for us? Uh, uh, to have a renewed vision. Firstly, it's about a renewed commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. And secondly, it's about a renewed commitment to consecration. Now, there was a popular movie uh, back in the 80s called uh, The Karate Kid. Uh, there was also a remake uh, of the movie in 2010, which starred uh, Jackie Chan and uh, Jaden Smith. In fact, uh, some of you may know Cobra Kai, Cobra Kai, the Netflix series, which is actually a sequel uh, to the original uh, Karate Kid films. Now, the movie tells of uh, this teenager by the name of Daniel, uh, who learns karate from a Japanese sensei, Mr. Miyagi. Now, in his passion, uh, Daniel was obviously looking forward to learn uh, karate la, and all these fancy karate moves. Uh, however, his training starts with boring and tedious chores at his sensei's house. So he was made to uh, polish the floor, right? So his, his, his sifu, his sensei, Mr. Miyagi, would tell him, sand the floor, sand the floor. And he was also made to uh, clean and wax his uh, sensei's car, wax on, wax off, he was told, right? And he was made to paint the fence and also paint the house, up, down, up, down, side, 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 side. So he kept doing that, right? The, uh, uh, the sensei kept making him do all these chores. Now, naturally, Daniel would have felt upset. He would have felt frustrated, thinking that his sensei is just using him uh, as free labor uh, to do work around his house. But the sensei had a purpose in making Daniel do all these things. Now let's watch a clip from the movie that shows the moment uh, Daniel discovers why his sensei made him do all the chores. Now please excuse uh, the video quality. Uh, it is, after all, a movie from the 1980s. So, so you're supposed to teach and I'm supposed to learn, remember? Ah, uh, you learn plenty. I learned plenty. I learned how to sand your decks, maybe. I wash your car, paint your house, paint your fence. I learned plenty, right? Uh, not everything is as seen. Oh, I'm going home, man. Daniel-san! Daniel-san! What? Come here. Show me sand the floor. I can't move my arm, all right? What are you doing? What are you... Ow! What? Ow, what are you doing? Now show me sand the floor. How did you do that? Shut up! Sand the floor. Hmm. Da, 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 da. Stand up. Show me sand the floor. Sand the floor. Sand the floor. Big sucker. Sand the floor. Sand the floor. Now show me wax on, wax off. Hey. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Hey, wax on, hat. Wax off. Concentrate. Look at my eye. Lock a hand. 
some means thy wax on hat, wax off hat, wax on hat, wax off hat, wax on, wax off, Ush. show me paint the fence, up, down, up, down, up, down. Other side, look I, always look I. Show me paint the house, side, side. Black wrist, side, 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 side. Yes. Show me wax on, wax off. Yes! 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 Show me paint the fence. Yes! 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 Show me side to side. Yes! 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 Show me sand the floor. Yes! 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 I always look I come back tomorrow. Suddenly, it all made sense for young Daniel and, and, and the sensei demonstrated to him that the repetitive housework that he was doing, whether it's sand the floor, uh, wax on, wax off, up, down, side, side, has actually helped him to learn important uh, karate defensive blocks and movements through muscle memory. These were the fundamentals, the fundamentals that needed to be built right before advancing further in the karate training. Now, in the same way, the fundamentals of the mission of the church are critical if we are to make advances for God's kingdom. It's, it's not about being fancy, it's about being faithful, faithful to the fundamentals of God's purposes for the church. And, 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 and the decisive factor is not how slick or how polished our church programs are, but how faithful and committed are we to our purpose as God's people. Therefore, as we talk about a renewed vision from God, it needs to go beyond just merely uh, reworking or rebranding our church programs. Uh, in, in, in a world that is disillusioned, in a world that is disconnected, what really makes an impact is a community that is united by love, by discipleship and holiness. So we must have the fundamentals and we must have them strong. And so we need a fresh rediscovery of God's vision for the church, which is a renewed commitment to the great commandment and the great commission and a renewed commitment to consecration. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your love and mercy towards us. We thank you for the gift of your Son that has redeemed us. And we are now yours, Lord, by grace through faith on the basis of Jesus Christ. And we as your covenant people, we as your church, Lord, we come before you and we pray and ask for your forgiveness, for your cleansing, and for us to be consecrated, Lord. Lord, liberate us, Lord, from things that are hindering us from a truly holy and consecrated communal life in Christ. And we ask, O oh God, that as we are consecrated to you, as we are redeemed to you, Lord, you will be pleased to use us, to look upon us with favour, with your grace, that, Lord, that we as a church that is faithful to your great commandment and your great commission, 
consecrated to you, Lord, we will be faithful and fruitful in drawing people into the kingdom and the family of Christ. Lord, we offer to you our prayers. We ask of you in humility and we ask, O oh God, that you will be merciful towards us. When we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Thank you, Brother Colin, for that timely word. Once again, thank you for joining the service. If you are new or have a prayer request or a testimony to share, we would love to hear from you. Kindly scan the QR code on the screen below or click the link below and we would love to connect and hear from you. Friends, I trust that you have been blessed, encouraged and challenged by the Lord in today's service. So let's commit all to the Lord. Father, we thank you that you are working in our lives and that you love us and that your word has been sown in our hearts. Help us, O oh God, to live out your word faithfully and fruitfully in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. God bless and see you next week.